I'm Janine Stanley. I am the Explorer Community Manager here at IRA, welcoming you to Afternoon at the Museum. This is our last uh, official Afternoon at the Museum show for 2020, but never fear because the show will go on and we'll have a special announcement about some very cool programming coming up before the end of the year when we are finished today. But now I'm going to turn it over to our host, Stephanie Watts, to introduce our guest, our agent, and our really cool museum. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in. Our illustrious guest today is Lex Gillette, um, Ira Explorer and Paralympian. Did I get that right, Lex? Got it right. Okay. And Caleb Thomas, our agent extraordinaire, is going to be uh, walking us through the museum. Yay, Caleb. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, we've got Janine and Ryan Um in the in the background, but really in the foreground of all of this, they make all of this work, technology works so well for us. And we're really glad you guys joined us today for the museum. Um, this is the US Olympic and Paralympic Museum in Colorado Springs. And so um, to get us started, uh, Caleb, maybe you can tell us where we are do you have a view? Are we, um, this might not be one of the museums with the, the 360 virtual view, but maybe this you one, can this give one some is on this mm -hmm. one. Um, now it does, there is a um, museum sizzle reel that it has that like mm -hmm. kind of um, shoots around to the different areas of the museum really fast. I could put that video on and then pause it at moments and describe like the, uh, mm -hmm. the opening for your, well, you know what, I, like that. With, because we have Lex with us today, um, Lex, maybe you could tell us about your experience as a Paralympian and what all of this is like. And I don't know if you've had a chance to actually go to this museum um, previous to today's show, but um, maybe we could start there and then move to what you just said, Caleb. That sound okay? Yep. Yep. No, that's cool. And I haven't, I haven't personally went to the museum yet. Uh, I know it hasn't it hasn't been open too too long. I've had some communications with people making sure that certain facts and information is correct. But outside of that, certainly haven't had the luxury of going to the to the museum yet. But I am excited to go because I, I hear it's really phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, for everyone who's listening, I am I'm a Paralympian, a four time Paralympian, actually. So been to the games. Uh, 2004 Athens, 2008 Beijing, 2012 London, 2016 Rio, and currently training for Tokyo in was supposed to be 2020, but now it's going to be in 2021 because of the pandemic. So currently training for that. Um, but I was, I mean, ultimately, um, oh, and I am a, an IRA explorer as well. So been involved with IRA since, oh gosh, maybe like 2016-ish now. Um and uh, yeah, but the experiences as as a Paralympian, um, man, I don't know where you want me to start, Stephanie. That's so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. You started in twenty twenty. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, two thousand four, and maybe you could tell us about your um, your actual event that you participate in, or yep. or if you do more than one. And and also, I understand that you have a YouTube channel, and I don't know, Caleb. If uh, if Lex shares the um, YouTube channel, can you pull that up in a little bit? Or I'm positive I can. Okay. So yeah, let's tell us about how you came to all this. Yeah. So it uh, for me, it all started in high school. So I feel like I was one of the fortunate ones. A lot of a lot of Paralympians out there may hear about it later in life or. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have a doctor who performed a, an operation on on um, whatever they need to get, um, you know, whatever they're they're working on. And maybe that doctor knows about the Paralympics or maybe they just read about it in a magazine. But for me, it was I was in high school and I had a teacher who who knew everything about adaptive sports and recreation. So he was able to start me on that journey at an early age. He noticed that I was athletic 
we figured it out through a, a physical fitness test. And um, from there, it was him painting this this image of me potentially going to the games and traveling the world and breaking records and winning medals. And, uh, you know, at 15 years old, that sounds really exciting. <laughs> like, I'm, of course. Yeah, yes, I'm, I want to. <laughs> uh, I want to win medals and, and travel the world. Um, but uh, literally, he uh, painted that that image for me. And from there, it was, he actually took me to a, a sports education camp that was being put on by United States Association of Blind Athletes, so USABA. Okay. Uh, really awesome organization. I'm sure a lot of, a lot of the listeners may know about it. Um, and this particular camp was in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and there were a number of different activities that you could participate in from track and field, all of the events in track and field to swimming, to wrestling, goal ball, cycling, so many different things to, to test out and figure out where your skill sets lie. And Mm -hmm. uh, from that camp, it was evident that I was, I was pretty good at track and field. And uh, from there, I went back to North Carolina where I'm from. And I joined my high school track team, competed on my high school track team for my junior and senior year. That was uh, you know, interesting. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, but certainly being on a, uh, a mainstream track and field team, there were a number of different uh, experiences with competing at, at other high schools where there aren't any visually impaired athletes at all. And you have to deal with people's perceptions and, and like questions Definitely. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but um, yeah, long story short, uh, I, I started my journey when I was 16. And uh, you know, a couple of years later, I found myself at my first Paralympic Games. And that was an experience that is, man, it's, it's so hard to, to think that it's been that long. But just imagine yourself, you, you get on this plane and you're, you're traveling across the ocean to Athens, Greece. My first time outside of, I've been to Canada before, but I don't know. Canada doesn't really count. Like that's, that's next door. <laughs> uh, exactly. So, <laughs> You're on well, your way to we Athens, did, Greece. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the, I mean, there's so much there in terms of Olympic history, uh, like, like biblical history. I mean, it's just, it's Greece, like yeah. it's Greece. Um, and so we go over there and, and, and there's so much excitement from all types of angles. You get into this this village, which is a large area where all of the athletes stay. Mm-hmm. You have a ginormous cafeteria inside where you have so many different types of food from McDonald's to Caribbean food to Japanese food or Asian mm-hmm. food to mm-hmm. uh, South American food. So you can choose whatever items that you want um you can get massages whenever you need you can uh go to the the rec area which has it differs from from village to village but some of them have pianos and and keyboards and uh drums and things like that or video games um one the one in london rock star status (laughs) yes they yeah they they (laughs) definitely treat you well i think Mm -hmm. even in london we had a movie theater there was a recording studio, so if you wanted to go in there and put your put some vocals down, put some raps down, you go in there and and, and go uh, lay a, lay an album. Um, oh, okay. Well, just yeah. while you're uh, while off you're competing, hours, that's it. Well, you're that's just that's competing, it. and then I'm gonna go do an album, and then I'm gonna do some more. <laughs> <laughs> all right, exactly. Um, so you have all of those things inside yeah. of of the village. Even, I mean, there's there's other things like like a bank. If you want to get a pedicure, mm-hmm. a manicure, or a haircut, um, different like restaurants, souvenir shops, like all of those things are inside of the the village. Even a, a, a post office, so you can mail things back home or send postcards mm-hmm. or whatever. Okay. Okay. So they try to make sure that you know that that environment is inclusive of, of everything that you could possibly need. Um, but then you get to the actual the the competition venues, which is why you're supposed to be there, right? And um, <clears throat> you uh, get to the stadium, very large. Um, being a track and field athlete, the, the stadium is huge. They usually make it to where it fits around. It could be anywhere from eighty to 90,000 fans mm-hmm. inside of the stands. 
And uh, so you you get to this call room area first, which is puts you in the mind of like this this canopied area where you walk up and they make sure that you have these these rectangular numbers that are on your your jacket, the front, mm -hmm. on the back, and that has your number and your name. You also have that number on your your bib on your competition top as well. So they're checking all of these things to verify that it's really you. And you go inside, they go through all of your bags to make sure that you have the appropriate equipment. For me, I use spikes. So I'm a, a long jumper and a sprinter. So I have these, uh, you know, interesting looking shoes that have spikes on the bottom, which <clears throat> gives me the ability to, when I'm on the track, I'm able to grip the track and, and, and really pick up some, some major speed. And they're making sure that those spikes meet the, the regulation length. So you mm -hmm. can't have something that's too, too long. Mm -hmm. They're going through all of those things. We have to wear a blindfold as well when we're competing. So they want to make sure that. Exactly. Oh, okay. exactly. That was it. When I had first gotten into the sport, I was like, that makes no sense to me. But all right, cool. <laughs> I'll make the rules. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So they make sure that everyone's blindfold is completely opaque so that everyone's on a level playing field and they make sure we have no electronics. So if you have your phone, you have any type of music player, whatever, they're they're taking that until competition is over. And it has to deal with um, not being able to you know, have any communication with um I'm, I'm guessing someone who may be able to right, you know, give you some right. information that you can right, use. Right, It levels a thing. Exactly. And so once you get through that and make, you know, everything is good, you check out, then they line all of the athletes up and their guides. That's, that's something I didn't mention. So as a blind athlete, you have a guide who you compete with, whether you're in a sprint race, you have the guide who's running to your left or right hand side and you use a tether that connects okay. at the hand. Okay. to make sure that you're locked up when you're running. Mm -hmm. um, or in my case, in the long jump, your guide is someone who stands in one stationary location and they're giving you this audible uh, clapping and yelling, straight, 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 straight. So you can find out which direction you need to run. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the field events, you're not allowed to, your guide can't move. So you have to do everything via the the auditory signals auditory cues so um so they line up the athletes and the guides you're walking through this this tunnel and that's when everything kind of hushes and it gets quiet because the anticipation is building and people are like all right wow this is this is that moment that we've been waiting for and a lot of that is you know i'm from america and i may have this competitor from brazil or ukraine and asia and uh you know people may be saying things but i don't know what they're saying mm -hmm. um but again just that anticipation is building and finally you get to this point where you you reach the mouth of the stadium and it opens up so wide and so huge you're inside of this large structure excuse me um and you're on you're walking on the track which is made out of this we call it mondo surface and the best description for that that I could say is it's probably like a like a rubberized mm -hmm. type of feel, but it is is it gives you this this firm type of feel, but you're still able to get a response from it when you're running. So it actually, in a lot of ways, when you press that spike, that shoe into the ground and apply that force, the the track almost like allows your leg to respond in a way where it's, it's propelling you which really helps yeah. you to, you know, you think about a Usain Bolt who ran, I guess it was like 960 something in the hundred meters in, in 2008. Um, he's already fast, but when you get athletes on those types of surfaces, they're really able to display just how fast they are. Um, so again, you're inside of this, this humongoid stadium and uh, they walk you around the, uh, you know, a specific area to make sure you know, you're not interrupting any other events that are going on. Mm -hmm. You eventually get to the long jump area where you, you sit down and get everything situated. And uh, from there, it's it's uh, it's competition on, time. Huh? 
yeah come on. It's competition time and yeah and I, I, yeah i mean it's it's an amazing feeling you know that there's so many people on there you can hear the claps you can hear the yells you can hear the pa announcer it's it's, it's just it's a, a just an amazing experience well let me ask caleb do we have any clips of lex in the museum or would would we be able to um um, I, I didn't find any on the museum itself site, um, but I do have have a number here. I have um, I have his TEDx San Diego talk. I have a video of him in the hundred meter in the two thousand sixteen. Did you win that one, Lex? We don't want to show video that. Not, <laughs> not not that one. You know what? I gotta. I actually have a link that I can put in the chat. Yeah. Here. Hold on yeah. a second. See. We'll we'll take a look at Lex and then we can move but on into I wanted, the museum. <laughs> I wanted to um, uh, describe the blindfold that he was mentioning oh, because okay. it's not just like a regular blindfold. Okay, no, like, no, it's not. It, oh. it looks <laughs> it looks like 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 something like a superhero would wear. Like, <laughs> like it's very it's it's very kind of angular. It's a um, opaque plastic. The ones in the picture I'm I'm looking at right now mm -hmm. are like a cobalt blue. Um and 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 yeah they're they they look like uh look like like kind of like um bigger swim goggles. Um but oh, okay. then the the like the front surfaces has like kind of um uh, hard, hard angles like at the at the edges, and then on the left temple, there's a little Nike swoosh. Okay. Wow. I. I and on know. the inside, so what? What you can't see. Sorry to cut you off, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. oh, on okay. the inside of it, what you can't see is uh, so there's a braille message on the inside of the blindfold, and it it says no fear. Oh. And so that's almost kind of like a. a you know, a reminder that in all of these competitions that we go to, sometimes things may not go the way mm -hmm. you want them to. And, and, you know, nothing is, is ever perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, to always go into those situations and, and to not allow those moments of anxiety or pressure to consume you, because it, it can certainly feel very daunting when you're in front of all of those people trying to, you know, you got to perform at a specific time. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, to go along with the amazing experience of being in in the competition, you you are after all in competition. Yeah, and, you know that probably brings a little bit of anxiety for some. But once the you know once it all begins, then it's no fear. Yeah, yeah, no, it's game time. Game time. So I just sent I sent a link to uh, Caleb of one of the races um, that we were in. We were actually in the uh, Paralympic Stadium, the London Paralympic Stadium. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll give a, a good idea of, you know, kind of how it works when you're um, in the, the sprinting events, especially. So you long jump, you sprinted, um, any others? That's it. Yeah, <laughs> that's anything a, that's else, a, I think I'm gonna fall a, apart. Okay. I know, <laughs> I was just thinking, well, that's probably enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you describe long jumping, um, the idea that you you are not tethered, you are, and I'm trying to picture this, um, you are literally running, preparing to make your jump and just responding to the auditory cues. Exactly. So is, to, to give him give him more context. So my guide is probably about 120 feet away from where I'm standing. Mm -hmm. And he's standing literally at the point where I need to take off from. Um, he first will walk me to the start mark where I need to start from, make sure that I'm straight and that I'm in the middle of this runway that's probably about three feet wide. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so you have, although it's three feet wide, you still have a good bit of distance on either side. However, you want to mm -hmm. you want to maintain that straight line. Um, and whether you are sighted or blind, every jumper knows how many steps that it takes to cover the amount of ground that they have measured. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's one of the key parts of the event. So I know that that 120 feet or so, that takes me 16 strides to cover. So when we're training, we're working to have the same run over and over and over and over again mm -hmm. so that when we reach that final step, we're in that takeoff zone. 
And one of the adaptations for the blind athletes in the long jump is that, so on the Olympic side, they have a, a board that I want to say is about six inches uh six inches from the from the front of the board to the or from the back of the board to the front of it Mm -hmm. and and so when they jump from that they want to get as close to the front edge as possible without stepping over it if you step over then it's a a disqualified jump Mm -hmm. and that one doesn't that doesn't count um but for the athletes who are visually impaired uh, specifically the totally blind athletes there is a, a board that is a meter in in size and they put a a light coating of uh probably i say like baby powder i don't think it's i don't know if it's baby powder (laughs) but it's some sort of white powder that they put on top and so when you run and jump from that area they measure from the 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 toe of that footprint that's in that uh that powder and they measure from that toe to where you land inside of the sand pit so that's one of the adaptations um that they have for us, but um, everything else stays the same. You have to, if you step past that metered mark, then it's a, a foul and that jump won't count. Mm-hmm. So Caleb, do we have the uh, Yep, the video? and I have my screen shared so that anyone can. Okay. <clears throat> someone to, to be as fast as the point right. so, uh, um, especially the boys have uh, a big issue there finding a, um, a good fit for a guide um the women are allowed to run sprint, with guide guides um, which makes the whole thing a bit easier um, um, by, okay. caleb you might yeah, you might want to start from the beginning okay so, yeah, it, um, he it, some, it started hey, started in the awesome. center so like i didn't know if you had it cued to that specific no 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 for some i don't know that's awkward impairment and the European champion, Timothy Adolf, does not start in this. He was due to be in lane five. It looks like it's Lex from the U.S. and the Met Kunk from Turkey. And couldn't pronounce that. World long jump champion. All right, the video Won that twice in a row. Lex and his guy. The U.S. Olympic Training Center in Chile, Vista, California. Mm-hmm. The alongside Lex Gillette, his guide, Mason Rose. Lane three for Turkey. Silver in the 200 meters in last year's European. His, guy, his, his, his blindfold his not nearly as cool as this. It's, it's more of a standard. Five attempt, he was due to be Timothy Adolf. And in seven for Thailand. All of the guides are wearing like um, bright no yellow vests to distinguish Big debut them in this stadium, as London 2012. Just the winner to go through from the three heats and one lone fastest loser. So Lex Gillette right. now yeah, has the fastest uh, TV in this field. This Timothy Adolf shot is currently focused is scratched. on Lex. His guide is next to him, also on blocks. Maybe a plethora of reasons for that, but he was in the start list released this morning. Quite a few athletes. Right, his Including guide is Cox, putting his Doha hand on tight, the ground. Lovely. Um, the call room. so that Lex can place his hand like right at the right so spot. it's Gillette in one <laughs> two, in hand. three Songpinit in seven right now it's a shot of all Just three to go athletes through. and guides away they go Gillette had a little wobble on the blocks but he's running in a stride alongside his guy Mason Rhodes Songpinit second took third took coming Lex out but Gillette will take it Gillette wins. 11.6 <laughs> seconds. This guy was so close. Like, it was a considerable, oh, like, so not a, third place. Not even a chance Solid morning work. for victory. <laughs> nice work. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that's one of my favorite races to watch. Uh, these complete. Nice work. Yeah, so, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, when so when uh, Caleb was saying that the guy was putting his hand on the ground, Stephanie, he was basically putting his hand on the uh, the start line. So okay. making sure that uh, making sure that my hand didn't is not on the start line. You can get as close as possible, but you can't put your hand on the line. And uh, that's a disqualifier. So yeah, and so he puts his hands there to make sure that this is where you can't exceed. And then he'll go to his blocks, uh, set himself up. Oh, okay. Get and, you. Uh, yo. Okay. 
Well, and this this helps um, because I have to be honest and admit track and field has been uh, something I didn't really watch or haven't paid much attention to in the Olympics because it's never been described as well as, as Caleb just did, actually. Yeah. I mean, you don't really yeah. know what's going on. You just think people run. And so, exactly. it, and this is, this is um, hopefully giving people, encouraging people to, you know, get out when, um, uh, when you can, however, 2021 works out for you, get out. And if you haven't um, participated in any kind of sports, get started. We've got these wonderful yeah. organizations and people um, and, and people such as Lex who are in our uh, Ira Explorer community um, who, who are um, very competent and able to um, serve as uh, good role models for people. So um, with that, so I actually had a, had a question if that's all right. Oh yeah. Sure, um, sure. Because I noticed as you're, you're running, like your, uh, your guide, like he is in step with you the, the entire, entire way. Yeah. Uh, what is the process of like finding a guy that can stand up with you can hold, you know, his own, like, like to be that. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So when you get to that level, you get to the Paralympic level, you certainly want someone, you want someone who's significantly faster than you so that they can hit those repetitions, bam, 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 bam. Because if you have someone who, who they essentially run the same, uh, same time as you, you're almost, it's almost like you're competing against each other. So for someone who runs, let's say 11 point, I don't know, 11.3 seconds in a hundred, you probably, you want someone who runs sub 11 in the 100, because if they're running 11 threes, if that's your best, that's not going to tax them that much. And in these, these races where you're having to, I mean, you may have a, a prelim in the morning uh, a quarterfinal at night and the semis the next day and then the finals at night, you want someone who the the recovery time for them is going to be, it's going to be, you know, basically nothing. Um, whereas for you, you know, it might take a little bit, it might tax you a little bit, uh, but you don't want two, you don't want athlete and guy both to be 100% tapped out because that just wouldn't provide for a, a synchronous race. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And so we know, too, in this museum, we've got great examples of swimmers and um, yeah, I was going to say, talk about Brad, <laughs> because Brad, Brad is pretty phenomenal. I know Brad. He's a yeah. swimmer. Oh, is this um, Brad Schneider that you're talking about? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I have his article, like his little spotlight from the museum. here. Well, let's museum. let's hear about Brad. Uh, so the, it's a it's a little article that the. Um, museum has in its digital collection they call it uh this shows a photo of brad he's in the water he's got his hands out raised he's got his uh mask goggles in his right side um a right hand and he's holding them up to the air it says brad snyder wins consecutive gold medal mm -hmm. one year to the day after an explosion while serving in afghanistan left him blind U.S. Navy Lieutenant Brad Snyder scored an emotional victory in the men's 400 S S11 freestyle to win his second gold medal of the London 2012 Paralympic Games. Captain of the swim team at the U.S. Naval Academy, Snyder rediscovered swimming after his injury. His first gold medal at London was in the men's 100 S11 freestyle, and he added silver in the 50 free. It is really hard to imagine I've come this far in a year, Snyder said after winning the 100. This whole journey has been one foot in front of the other. Each step has held an immense degree of uncertainty, even down to this morning. I don't know how to swim. I don't know how the swim would go or how my nerves would be in front of all of the people. It even carried into tonight, but to be able to come out and perform and get to the wall is an amazing feeling. Following up his success in London, Snyder won three gold medals and one silver in, at Rio 2016, and his performance in the 100-meter freestyle S11 was one to remember. Snyder finished in 56.15 seconds, breaking a world record that had been the long-standing Paris swimming mark of all time, set by the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Hall of Famer John Morgan. Snyder was honored as the male athlete of the Paralympic Games at the team's USA Awards. Nice. There's also we, a, 
there's also an article on John Morgan, if you want to want me to read that one. Well, actually, I was thinking that um, you had mentioned earlier that we have some, I think they call them hidden gems in, yep. in the museum. Yeah, um, do it. any of those give us some pictures and some things that we can share with uh, with the audience? Yeah, they do. Um, so there's one that, uh, so at the, there's a statue that is at the opening to oh. the museum. And at, uh, in the front, there's a, uh, uh, yeah, so there's a statue and it's called Olympus, Olympus within. Um, it says this 400 pound bronze sculpture, a favorite of team member Trey, Trey O was created by 1984 U.S. Olympic fencer, Peter Schriffen and <laughs> features the handprint of 1996 U.S. Paralympic discus thrower, Nathan Perkins. You might notice the similarities between the piece and the museum's design. It's no coincidence. Schifrin and the building's design architect Diller, Scofito, and Renfro were inspired by an athlete in motion, a discus thrower. Mm -hmm. nice. So, um, so the statue, it's it's humanoid. Um, like it definitely looks like 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 a person, um, but it looks more. Um, like you're seeing the the musculature mm -hmm. underneath the the person, but it's um, it's abstract, you know, like like it doesn't look like perfect representations of of the muscles. Um, it looks it's a bronze statue, but color wise, it's more of like a like a dirty silver, a pewter <laughs> kind of color. I like that dirty silver. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like it's got a patina. Uh -huh. um, and then in it's, so it is of a discus thrower and it's got uh, the, the, the thrower is mid, mid spin. And, and so the, uh, the right arm is stretched out behind it. The left arm is kind of, um, kind of cocked uh, mm -hmm. so that it can get that full, range of motion, full momentum. Uh, it has a discus in its right hand. The hand actually looks like a hand, um, like, or at least it has a thumb. So I, I don't, I can't tell if right. it has the rest, but, um, uh, and the head though is more of a, I don't know, it's, it's, it's not even, super head shaped it's more of a, like a rectangle with like <laughs> it's rectangular shape and it kind of goes in the center at a point yeah. which is like sort of evocative of a nose um, yeah, I, I think it would give somebody the idea of, of a person in motion and kind of an abstract way would you say is that is that yeah yeah definitely fair, fair to say it like that and um <laughs> I'm trying to find a picture of the of the actual museum that I can uh, mm -hmm. describe because the I, I do see when when they when they say that they were inspired by a discus thrower, I can I can see um, sort of what they mean mm -hmm. um, just in an abstract way because yeah, it, it's not loading. <laughs> the United States athletes. There it is. Okay. So it's very, very modern. Like, like in, in my head, it kind of brings up like Star Trek space. Mm -hmm. Japan, you know, mm -hmm. like, like it's very, very angular. Um, lots of, lots of flat surfaces surfaces that then um, kind of seamlessly go into rounded smooth surfaces so there's no actual mm -hmm. hard angles I see. okay but there's it really lots is fluid. Of, yeah yeah so so there's there's no real hard angles but um, but there's lots of flat surfaces okay. uh, and and the, the the um almost kind of like 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 a uh, the there looks like there's different wings sort of of the building mm -hmm. you know or at least of the 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 roof or the facade of the building um and the way the way they're they're situated like 
it's a, a vague spiral, mm-hmm. you know, almost like like a, like a pinwheel, like uh, that mm-hmm. you would hold and blow, um, kind kind of like that, or like a nautilus shell. Um, mm-hmm. But I could also see the kind of in motion, you know, because it would almost be like if you took pictures shot by shot by shot of the arm kind of going yes. around. Um, so, so yeah, I, I can see that, but yeah, if it was like a very mm-hmm. robot throwing discus. So we had Brad, um, and I don't know again, if, if, uh, we've got some, um, um, footage of Brad. I noticed also in addition to Brad, there's, well, obviously there's several, uh, Paralympians here. And um, I'm told by people who shared information about the museum with me that uh, it's fairly new. I think they opened in 2019, maybe. Um, yeah, I think and, so. Yeah, so they've, yeah. they've got oh. a, a lot of stuff going on there. You've got Brad, you've got another gentleman whose name is Andre Shelby. And Andre Shelby is also an ex-military veteran um and he um participated in archery and uh i was gonna say i think i remember him i went to check out some archery in 2016 and i think he was out there competing yeah he's the first black u.s paralympic archer uh and he won in rio yeah he won gold in rio so we've got him in 2016 games um and then there's a, the last woman, young woman I'll talk about briefly is, and you may see these guys, Caleb, somewhere in the articles, uh, Anastasia, I'm gonna try pronouncing her last name, Paganos. Paganos. Um, and she's a young person hoping to represent the USA in 2021 Paralympics in um, Tokyo. And uh, yeah, I think she is a runner as well. So maybe in the few minutes we have, we can look at the, did we call them hidden gyms or 100 gyms? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So that was the, that was the first one. Um, here's another one that I thought was, was pretty interesting. They have this interactive this exhibit mm-hmm. that um, it looks like, Right now, it has two different uh, people. They've got Paralympic gold medalist Matt Scott and Olympic gold med- medalist Kicken Randall. Um, and yeah. it is a basically it is a large, like seven or eight foot screen that has like a um, like an image of the the person of the mm-hmm. athlete and then in front of it there is a uh like a touch pad okay. and you're able to answer or ask the athlete questions um okay like by and 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 it has like a whole uh full conversation and it says located in the world watches gallery the ask an athlete exhibit allows guests to have a full conversation with paralympic gold medalist matt scott and olympic gold medalist kick and randall fan of vanilla ice team member whitby suggests asking kicking for her favorite song <laughs> yeah and i'm not sure if it says but matt scott is wheelchair basketball player and mm-hmm. kick and randall is what is she I think she's biathlon. I think she's on the winter side. Um, so yeah. She's like caught what is cross she? Country cross country skiing. skiing. Yeah. Yep. yep. Nice. Uh, well, mask a- mascot is a baller though. He he's like pretty good. <laughs> I noticed um as I was on the website recently, they have wheel t- is it wheelchair tennis? Like, yep, they have wheelchair tennis, they have wheelchair basketball, wheelchair mm-hmm. rugby. Well, okay. So there's a lot. There's a lot of things for people to participate in. Of course, you know, for those of us with blindness, 
we, well, at least I can say I, I'm kind of gravitating toward learning more about the other blind athletes because it just helps to um, inspire and encourage to see yeah. all of you guys. Um, yeah, And of course, I include you in this, Lex, because you've been at it a while. You know, all of you guys are just amazing um, athletes and you, um, yeah, you, you, you do amazing things. And I'm sure your training isn't easy and you have to ded be dedicated and committed to it. Um, but the results are gold. And, and right. Um, yeah. And, and even when we were talking about previously about just, I mean, you may not reach that level of, of Paralympic status, but just for anyone who's just a, you know, an exercise enthusiast and, you know, who wants to get out there and, and get the blood moving and, and yes. be physically active. I mean, that's just as important also. Uh, I mean, definitely in, in this day and age and staying healthy and, and just keep moving around. I think it's, it's certainly important. Yes, it is. Uh, I found an exhibit here that mm -hmm. I think Lex will be into. I mean, I, I think everyone will, but it's definitely in his uh, field house. Um, it's a very subtle exhibit. It says, looking all the way up at the highest overlook may put a crick in your neck, but that's how far Bob Beeman leapt to win gold at Mexico City 1968. While in the museum's atrium, team member Caleb T. advises you to look up. Jetting out into the atrium space are four observation platforms at different heights. Guests in the gallery can walk out onto the platform to see below. Pay special attention to the highest. The height of this platform happens to be nearly the same distance as Bob Beeman's incredible 1968 long jump of 29 feet, two and a half inches. That stood as the record for 23 years and remains the Olympic record 52 years later. Wow. Um, and, and so in the, in the photo, you see it and it's, a, it, it's over, you know, two stories high, like it's, there's, there's a person standing on the deck and a person beneath it. And there's one, two, three, at, at least four, at least four and a half, five body lengths between them. So like, depending on like about how tall you're, it's farther than you want to fall. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I'm thinking I don't want to fall two feet, let alone 29. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Um, amazing stuff. Um, yeah. You know what, Caleb, can you, can you do a quick check for this Andre Shelby? Yeah. And, uh, because and archery oh mm -hmm. yeah i'm gonna yeah, pop I, in and ask since we have the info from that jump so lex what is your personal best in the long jump uh 22 feet one inch Ooh. Mm. Ooh -wee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, got so you. I, I think i have maybe done that falling over my dog here in the house <laughs> <laughs> um, <you know? laughs> i'm pretty sure i did that most of it was on sliding on my face but you know <laughs> that's funny well, since we have an archer among us, Janine, right? You are an archer yourself? Or I, you I was an archer as a kid, and I was so excited to hear this story about Andre Shelby. Woo! Yeah. yeah I've, I've got him here. Okay. Let's learn about so, Mr. Shelby. Andre Shelby was the first black U.S. Paralympic archer winning gold at Rio in 2016. Photo shows uh, Shelby. He's holding a blue blue uh compound bow it's got multiple multiple strings on it he's pulling back one it also has like an attachment at the front that like kind of sticks out like a almost like a, like a bayonet mm -hmm. um, in front of it and he is wearing a hat that says united states paralympic team it says a motorcycle accident left him paralyzed from the chest down and forced him to retire from the U.S. Navy. But Andre Shelby's competitive fire remained strong as ever after falling in love with a new sport. Former high school athlete and always competitive, Andre Shelby's life took a turn when a mo motorcycle accident left him paralyzed from the chest down, forcing him to retire from the U.S. Navy after 18 years of service. While his life changed, Shelby's competitive spirit remained high. In a strange way, the accident led to Shelby becoming a world-class athlete. As part of an adaptive sports program during his rehabilitation, Shelby tried tennis, basketball, skiing, water skiing, and horseback riding, among other sports. Next up was archery, a sport he had never tried before. 
I never touched a bow or even thought about it other than maybe making a stick bow with rubber bands when we were kids, Shelby said. He attended a clinic hosted by Paralympic archer Jerry Shields. That led to a 200-mile trip for another clinic hosted by two other Paralympic archers, Jeff Fabry and Russell Wolf. It wasn't long until Shelby was hooked. Originally, it would be once a month. That turned into four times a month, and that turned into me wanting to buy a bow and try to get better and better, Shelby said. Archery is more about yourself. It's an individual thing. He had the ability and he had the drive, said Randy Smith, the head coach of the U.S. Para Archery National Team from 2005 to 2018. He wanted to, be, he wanted to get better, and he would put in the effort. He listened to coaching and listened to suggestions and was willing to try things out and see what worked for him. You're always, will, you're always trying to make yourself better, Shelby said. There is a certain discipline that you need to have. Everywhere I went, people were willing to help. It became addictive. However, as Shelby progressed through the sport, he often noticed he was one of a few, if not the only black athletes completed it, competing in para-archery. But I've never looked at it as me being the only one out here, Shelby said. The majority of people were always willing to help me out, whether it was giving me tips or helping me get somewhere I needed to be. I never felt like I was the only one. But in the back of my mind, I knew I was the only one out there. While Marilyn Shelby initially, while Marilyn Shelby initially thought her husband's interest in archery was more of a hobby, she started to realize it might be quite a bit more as he started competing in bigger and bigger tournaments, traveling further and further from their home in Jacksonville, Florida. On Father's Day in 2015, Shelby qualified for the U.S. national team in the Parapan American Games one month later. He won, he won the gold medal in Toronto. Then it was off to his first international competition in Germany, where Shelby helped the U.S. team win gold. There I was, a world champion, which was just unbelievable, Shelby said. That was the year that everything took off. It all came together at one time and carried over to 2016 in the Paralympics. Competing in the Parapan American Games and the World Championships were amazing experience, Shelby said. But qualifying for the Rio de Janeiro 2016 Paralympic Games and becoming the first black American archer to compete in the Paralympics was over the top. As he made his way around the Maracanã Stadium, while each country's delegation was introduced, Shelby marveled at the size of the crowd and the 4,327 other athletes representing 159 countries. The biggest thing that went through my mind was, I'm finally here, Shelby said. In 2012, I tried out for London and thought I was ready. But I was finally on the team in 2016 because in 2012, I was nowhere near ready. To finally make it to that goal, uh, and then it says in parentheses in 2016, that was just unbelievable and a whole different story. The story doesn't end there though. Seated 12th in the tournament field, Shelby advanced through the bracket. While the competition was not televised and his family followed the scoring online in the championship match, Shelby scored a 10 with his final shot to win the compound men's open gold medal by one point. Now Shelby is focused on qualifying for the Paralympic Games in Tokyo later this year. He tries to get to the archery range five times a week, practicing for two to three hours a day. He's always been real competitive and serious about his sports. Marilyn Shelby said it makes sense he's into archery as he is. He's so dedicated. Wow. Woo. <laughs> that is an amazing story. And Absolutely. Wow. I like archery. <laughs> That's not something we hear about all that often but um this is, oh. this is great this is great you, you hit a 10 on your final shot that's that's yes. like, yeah he, i he was gonna in. say can imagine wow. the feeling yeah, he, he the yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that, that that is very impressive and as you all can see, there is a whole lot to this museum to explore with one of our agents, and uh, we are happy to let you do that as we end our show today. Um, big announcement before we thank our host and our guest and our 
agent, but we will be talking on Saturday, December 26th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time with Dr. Linda Humes. And Dr. Humes is from John Jay University, and she is going to be presenting to us all about Kwanzaa. So if you've wondered what the Kwanzaa holiday is about, if you've wondered how you can be celebrating what all of the principles of Kwanzaa are, join us on actually what is the first day of this holiday on Saturday the 26th at 4 p.m. We'll have a, a video that Linda is putting together for us, and then afterward we will have a live Q&A. So if there is something that you see that you have a question about, whatever, um, Linda will be here. And we said, we're going to talk until we're done. <laughs> so um, we are looking at around a 90 minute presentation, but um, this is going to be really exciting. I, we are very lucky to have Linda uh, come and join us. And uh, she will be joining us throughout next year as well. And very soon we will be looking at our new uh, afternoon at the museum schedule for 2021. I can't tell you where we're going to be and when because we haven't figured that out yet, right, Stephanie? <laughs> well, no, we'll, we'll, we know if we know we have some things in the works. We do. We're going to have we a lot of fun. definitely do. And for these particular museums that have the focus on Black history and the Black culture, we are going to be weekly during Black History Month. We will have a different presentation every week. And one of those weeks is going to be specifically with the blind history lady who's going to be pointing out some stories about black blind people throughout the decades, which I found fascinating last year when I read them on Facebook. So excited about that. Plus, who knows what we'll come up with. Um, Dr. Humes may be taking us around Harlem on a virtual tour, which will be totally amazing, too. So with that, I want to thank our special guest, Lex Gillette. Thank you, Lex. I'm I'm just so excited now because I used to love to watch the Olympics and I was a big fan of Carl Lewis in the 80s and just watching yeah. him just rule track and field in the 80s was just incredible. And so this, this just brought me back to some of those images of, you know, the track and field different events yeah. and things like that and just being glued to the TV as a kid. So thank you so much for bringing all that fun back and uh, kind of giving us a, a feel for what that's like. Definitely. My pleasure. And with, with the increased television time for Paralympics, we should have like a, we need to have an Ira watch party next year. When yes. Oh my gosh, we yes. definitely should. Yes. Oh, that the games are be. in July. Is that right? I'm sorry. They yeah. Are, when are the they? Paralympics will be, well, the Olympics are in July and then the Paralympics start in August. Okay. So they I do follow. They start a, I'm, I'm sure we can like set that watch party up. Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like oh we're gonna, yeah. We're going to be there to see Lex uh, get another medal. Well, absolutely. Yeah. At absolutely. least one. <laughs> Lex and, yes. and we have a number of explorers who are also Paralympians. So we're going to cheer you guys on. Yeah, we're definitely. Team Ira here. <laughs> That'll be great. And you'll also have to let us know, you know, how you work in Ira to your training and to that whole Paralympic yeah. experience, because that will be fascinating, I think. Oh, uh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And let's uh, shout out to your uh, YouTube channel so people can go and follow you on YouTube and check out uh, all of your videos mm -hmm. and what you've got going on. Yeah, literally yeah. everything is my name. So it's just all Lex Gillette. Lex Gillette. Uh, Lex Gillette on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on LexGillette.com. So, uh, awesome. yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there. I have to say, you have one of the coolest names for an athlete. I I know. <laughs> Yeah, you just, you know, Lex Gillette is like, okay, <laughs> that's your sister. I, I am athlete. <laughs> or a superhero yeah, with that mask. Exactly. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that is great. And a giant thanks to our host for this bold new adventure of Afternoon at the Museum, and we're excited to pick it up for 2021. Stephanie Watts, thank you so much for all the great programming that uh, we've been able to, to uh, come up with this for, through this adventure. I have enjoyed um, this opportunity. Um, I think we've been at it now since the later part of August. Yeah, later um, part of August. It's, yeah, it's it's been one of the better parts of our fabulous 2020 for me personally. I hope that people who are either tuning in for the first time would get something out of it today. 
And for those who may have listened via IRAcast or however you stream later on, I, I hope you guys have had as much fun uh, enjoying the episodes as I have in hosting and being a part of this. Um, love the promotion, and I know the promotion will end, but it this um, brings um, about the reality that museums have a lot to offer. Very entertaining. You can gather up friends, family, or go alone and use Ira, uh -huh. you know, Absolutely. to walk through. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, Thank more you. description calls. Yay. Yes. Yay. <laughs> Yay for yeah, that, I was going to say, agents <laughs> love museums. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, say, the promotion might end, but the great description that your agents will provide will never end. And we'll so never you end. can always call anytime and get a museum done. And believe me, it is an amazing experience. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, I can't wait until we can actually go to museums again. Exactly. Like, that'll be, that'll exactly. Be, a blast like I I know. I, my husband and I were just talking about that and the list of places that we have and one of the places we may actually feature on afternoon at the museum one of our favorite places which is um, I'll spoil it it's the Polynesian Cultural Center uh, Ooh, on Oahu nice. and uh, yeah that's a fun one and uh, but I want to thank you Stephanie and thanks to our wonderful agents Caleb Thomas who is with us today and uh, volunteered for this when we put out the call we had several agents who kind of said in the beginning okay well we'll give this a try and sure <laughs> enough here we are thank you yeah. so much Caleb. Uh, Caleb. Uh, yeah. great work great. Got, like, description calls are my my favorite like he I, has had so. way too much fun you guys see the description or reading mail right caleb awesome and a final thanks to our uh with his brand new title our really? and, and i just i totally blanked on your title ryan man it's been a long week <laughs> oh, goodness long gracious. Week. <laughs> I, i'm just gonna call you youtube guru he uh, ryan works. is the reason that we are live on youtube yes. folks. so we are <laughs> so thankful to ryan for making that happen and uh I am Janine Stanley. I am your show producer and uh, the person who gets the set on the podcast for everybody. And we will be back with you again on Saturday, the 26th, and then every other Friday in 2021 with Afternoon at the Museum.